Angular launched in 2016 as a way to help developers build modern web applications. Throughout its history, Angular has made millions of developers successful. We've been focused on improving performance and developer experience on the modern web, and our momentum includes a ton of new features. And later this week, we will release Angular v17. This renaissance deserves a modern identity that represents the velocity and stability our team is committed to. Today, we are ecstatic to launch Angular.dev, the future home for Angular developers. Angular.dev will be the new site, domain, and home for Angular development. The new site contains updated docs, tutorials, and guidance that will help developers build with Angular's latest features. Today's launch includes new and revised documentation on Angular's core features, tutorials, and reference materials. In the coming months, we will continue to collect feedback and improve the site with a ton of enhancements planned. A cornerstone of the new docs is angular.dev forward slash tutorials, a fresh, interactive way to learn Angular directly in your browser. Our new tutorial offers a quick conceptual model for learning, or coming back, to Angular and a playground to experiment in. We will be building a robust cookbook of additional tutorials, taking advantage of our new embedded tutorial infrastructure. The domain isn't the only thing new about Angular.dev. Today, we're also releasing the new Angular logo and brand. Developers may remember the first AngularJS shield as a reference to the original HTML5 and CSS3 shields it joined at the time. A lot has changed since the HTML5 standard was first released, including us. As Angular continues to explore and innovate on the web platform, this new logo will better represent our current efforts and future priorities. Angular's success is deeply connected to our community. We know many of you have built your brands on top of ours. This logo is for us and our community, so it's important for you to be able to update your brand as well. Check out our blog and angular.dev's press kit for more information on how we're working with the community to adapt the new logo as your own. I'll meet you on angular.dev and welcome to the Angular Renaissance. Hello, Angular community, and wow, what a moment. You've just witnessed our new logo design and the fantastic new website, angular.dev. Welcome to the Angular v17 developer event. I'm Mark Thompson, and we're absolutely thrilled to have you here with us from all over the world. Now, speaking of here, we have our very own Emma Tversky in the building to tell us all about this new website, angular.dev. Now, be sure to put your questions for Emma in the chat, so that way we can be sure to see what you're saying and answer your questions. All right, Emma, let's talk about angular.dev. Let's do it. Oh, this is such a big moment for the team. How are you feeling? I'm just so excited that we finally get to share what we've been up to. Absolutely. This has been a big secret to have to hold while we work in open source. Tell the people what that was like. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, our team is heavily committed to open source. And uh, as soon as I get off stage right now, we'll actually be going and open sourcing the entire repository that this was built in. But over the last six months, we've been building this in private and trying to make sure that what we open source is a fantastic representation uh, of Angular v17 and where we're headed. So it's built with everything under the sun about what our team feels a good production Angular app would look like today. Oh, so good, so good. Now, what motivated the team to create a new site? How did we know this was time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's like a million things that we were really excited and we wanted to do differently in a new documentation site. Um, and obviously this is beta, so we're still going to learn and get feedback on maybe things that we can improve and do differently. Um, it all comes down to making sure developers know what modern Angular is. So from the logo all the way down to every page of the documentation, 
we were really focused on making sure that every level of developer, if you haven't ever worked with the web before, all the way to like, you're an expert and you know everything about Angular's internals, like there's something on this doc site that is meant specifically for you. Uh, so our tutorials, you helped uh, totally revise um, and you can now do tutorials totally in the browser. Uh, we have a full embedded learning environment. We have a playground for you to work with. Uh, our docs guides are like completely overhauled and we'll continue to overhaul them to really be in-depth guides. I mean, like everything under the sun, go to angular.dev and check it out. And I want to touch on something that I think is really important for our community to know. You mentioned that this is modern Angular, but it's still the same Angular that our friends have known, but we've just changed the way some things worked on the website. And tell us more about what it means for it to be modern, but yet the same. Yeah, absolutely. So as we've talked about, Angular's priorities have always been uh, performance and developer experience. We think Angular really hits that spot perfectly. Um, and so over the last couple of versions, we felt like Angular's already sort of entered a new era, or entered mm -hmm. this renaissance. Mm -hmm. And the logo really like should represent that, right? It represents everything in V14, V15, V16, everything we're going to talk about today in V17. But it also represents everything about where we're headed. So it's not some new framework. It's not Angular V3. Um, it's the same <laughs> stable backwards compatibility framework that people know and love but it also represents the velocity of all of these new things that are changing, you know, cutting edge control flow, deferrable views, like all of these new things that we're bringing to the web and even things that we haven't started working on, but we're excited to tackle next. That's right. And I think some of the features that you hinted toward, like control flow, deferrable views, friends at home, you do not want to miss that. Stick around for the show and you just have to see what we're talking about. Your mind, listen, just put your hands on the side of your head. That way your ear, your brain doesn't fly out of your ears. It's going to be really amazing. All right, uh, let's ask another question. Emma, what's the first thing developers should check out on the new site? Ooh, it, it depends who you are. Um, I think like we really wanted to take an approach to documentation that allowed you to come to Angular based on like what you need. So we've really like spliced out a lot of portions to make it easier to get started. Um, you know, that's built on top of the fact that the framework over the last few years has really tried to focus on being easier for developers. We've heard your feedback. Like, we want to make this easier for people to onboard to. So we have a whole new essentials guide that's completely written, brand mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. So if you're new to Angular, go to the essentials guide. Go to that small little section. It's about an hour of reading or less. Um, and it'll really let you understand Angular and what it means, like how to build with Angular. Um, if you really just like to code, go to the tutorial section and check out the totally brand new Learn Angular tutorial. Um, again, written from the ground up, and it's just a way to incrementally learn all of the tasks that you would need to do to be able to build as an Angular developer. I believe there's 22. Mm -hmm. uh, and the really cool thing about that is like each step is totally encapsulated in itself, right? So like if you know how to build components on Angular, skip the component steps. Just go to like, there's a new control flow step. Right, right. Nobody here knows how to build with control flow. I just took the tutorial myself because we are we haven't even released control flow uh, for developers. So you can go to each of those steps, do the developer task fully in the browser. There's no local setup. There's like no pain points to getting started. Um, so I think the tutorials and the essentials are probably the best places. All right, before have. we let you go, let's hear from our community. I'm sure they have a lot of feedback and a lot of thoughts. Let's just take a couple of uh, comments from our community. All right, is dark mode supported on the new website? Yes, it is. By default, uh, when you open the docs, it'll be set to whatever your browser setting is um, on your device. And then you can obviously overhaul it. Just click the lower left-hand corner um, to pick what type of version you want to see, but yeah. All right, we're going to be continuing this conversation all throughout the show, and people can find us online if they have more questions about that. Now, friends, here's what you can do. First, let's say thank you to Emma for coming to the show. A blast having you here. We're super excited about Angular.dev. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Friends at home, now you can head over to angular.dev to try out all these new features. All right, friends, in Angular v16, we introduced the new hydration story and SSR story to the Angular community. And guess what you told us? You said that you love this feature, but you wanted more. Well, you are in luck because Alon from the Angular team is here to give us the latest updates for SSR and Angular. Alon, take it away. Hi, everyone. I am Alan, a developer on the Angular team, and I'm here to share some wonderful news and latest updates on Hydration and Angular. In version 16, we launched a developer preview for Hydration, and so far, teams all over the world have been able to enjoy the performance and developer experience improvements it provides. Today, I am excited to announce that Hydration and Angular is now stable and ready to be used by you and your teams in production. That's right, Hydration is now production ready. We hope that you continue to leverage these powerful updates to Angular on the server experience, but that's not all. We've also wanted to give developers a better, smoother experience when creating applications that support server-side rendering and hydration. Today, we are announcing updates to NGNU that lets you create a server-side rendering hydration-enabled application from the beginning. You no longer have to perform extra steps in your application to add SSR support after the fact. When you create an application in Angular version 17, you have the option to pass the SSR flag directly to NGNU. Don't worry if you forget to specify the flag with NGNU. You will now be prompted to include it in your project during setup. If that wasn't cool enough, we've also done some behind the scenes improvements that we hope will make developers using SSR happy. We've added ESM support for server builds, so now developers can use ESM modules in their server side code. We know that everyone loves performance upgrades, so we have improved builds for server bundles. And we have added some SSR dev server improvements. All right, that's all the updates I have for SSR and hydration in Angular. Be sure to try out these features and let us know what you think. To get started, run NG Update. Thank you for watching. Now go NG Update. Angular on the server continues to be improved, and we really hope that you like what we've done so far. Now, to tell us more, please welcome Alan, Jessica, and Andrew from the Angular team. Hey. Hello. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, Alan. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, let's just get into it because I have a lot of questions for you, and I'm sure that our audience at home has a lot of questions. Uh, Jessica, why has the team put so much effort into improving the Angular server-side story? Well, uh, to be honest, server-side rendering has just been uh, becoming more of a priority in the web framework ecosystem across the board, and you're seeing that across all the frameworks. Um, but to be honest, um, a lot of people have just been asking us to do it, so we put a lot more effort into actually doing uh, work on server-side rendering. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Hey, Andrew, I got a question for you. Uh, tell us more about the performance improvements. Like, who will they affect, and how can we take advantage of these changes? All right, I feel like maybe Andrew's muted. So, Alan, why don't you take this question uh, until we get Andrew's audio back? Sure. Um, so in version 17, uh, we have implemented the ES build and feed pipeline. So users uh, can use, can leverage these two powerful build tools to have faster incremental build times and reduce build times. We also uh, now output ESM modules by default. And for new applications, we have enabled hydration by default. Fantastic. All right, Andrew, do we have you back here? Okay, so that's all right. Uh, let's let's go to Jessica. Jessica, tell us more about what's next for Angular SSR and the server side story. You bet. So uh, we are looking to improve compatibility for non-node environments. So you can deploy Angular apps basically all over in your favorite cloud providers and. Uh, one big thing that uh, we're very excited about is progressive hydration. That's next up on our hydration story that we're looking forward to. 
And then we're also exploring streaming, HTTP streaming. So that's very exciting and we're, we're looking forward to all of this. Fantastic of this. I love all of this. All right, then Alon, tell me this. There, we had SSR, but we also had this thing, Angular Universal before. Can we help people understand what's the status of the Angular Universal? So yeah, uh, so Angular Universal have been migrated and merged into the Angular CRI repository. And as part of that, we have renamed the packages and combined them into a single package named at Angular slash SSR. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, let's actually take some feedback from our audience here. All right, so Dinesh says, is SSR primarily catered towards low powered devices or is it for everyone? I guess I can answer this. Um, it's really for everyone. Um, it's something that's designed to you know, improve your initial load. Um, so it will help low power devices and people with slower speeds, but it improves everybody's initial load. So it's really for everyone. And Jessica, to follow up on that, I think that the changes that we've made to how when you build a new app, and like Alan mentioned that you can scaffold out your server side work, really does reinforce that idea that it is for everyone because we're making it even easier for you to opt in from the beginning. That's absolutely right, Mark. Well said. Fantastic. Uh, let's, let's hear another question from our audience. Okay, will local change detection be available in version 17? So while this isn't directly related to, what, to SSR, can we give them any hints? Or actually, let's save this question for later because there are some other pr presentations that you definitely want to see before we get to that question. Let me ask you folks one more question before we uh, say goodbye for now. Are there any updates for Angular pre-rendering? Or more important, just tell us more about just the future of SSR. Uh, I can take that one. So uh, as Jessica mentioned, for the future of SSR, we are uh, investigating streaming, HTTP streaming, and progress of hydration. Um, some other features that we are looking into to improve pre-rendering are um, the developer experience around, auto, around root discoverability of parameterized routes, and also uh, exclusion of routes from static site generation. Yeah, those are the main things that we're gonna look all right. Well, thank you so much to Alon, Jessica, and Andrew. Thank you all for hanging out. It has been a blast. Now, if you haven't already, please be sure to enter your questions into the chat for the Angular team. Now, as a reminder, these updates will be available when Angular v17 launches later this week on November 8th. Angular templates are at the core of the component development experience. And when we're introducing some updates that will change the way that you write your Angular templates, things are about to get awesome. Alex Rickabaugh is here to tell you more. I'm Alex from the Angular team, and I'm here to share some big news about the component authoring experience in Angular. We want to make writing components in Angular an enjoyable and productive experience. And we've been hard at work trying to find the next step in achieving that goal. And we think we found it. We're giving you new ways to write some of the logic in your template. I'm thrilled to introduce the new control flow syntax in Angular. This new syntax gives you new options for how you write if statements, for loops, and switch statements. We think this new syntax makes reading logic in templates easier, as well as writing it. And we didn't stop there. We've also included many highly requested features, such as else if, and we're improving the performance of key parts of control flow. So what will this new syntax look like? I thought you'd never ask. First, let's check out the new if syntax. The template keywords for control flow start with an at symbol that tells Angular this is a control flow statement. Next comes the keyword if. This looks a lot like a JavaScript if statement which should be more familiar to developers. Next comes the condition in parentheses, followed by opening and closing braces, which make it easier to group multiple elements together without the need for ng-container. Compared to the ng-if-based syntax, we find the new syntax is clearer, more robust, and easier to reason about. 
but can we do better? Yes. There's also support for else without the need for ng templates and variables. But why stop there? We're also introducing support for else if syntax. Now you can specify multiple conditional statements to fit your component's rendering needs. We've also included new for loop syntax. Check this out. The at for looks very similar to a TypeScript for loop. We're maintaining similar syntax for your iterables, but we're adding an important performance change. Track is now required. This will help your loops be faster and more efficient. To make this easier, track now lets you specify an expression directly. No more track by functions. You can also specify a fallback when there are no items in the list with the new at empty syntax. No need for fancy template magic, just clean, readable code. We've optimized the implementation considerably. At four is up to 90% faster when processing certain list updates. I bet some of you were wondering if we did anything to improve situations using switch. And the answer is yes. You can use the new at switch syntax to write clear, robust switch statements directly in your templates. With similar syntax as if and for, you specify the expression, then use the at case syntax to specify the clauses. And just like switch statements in JavaScript, you can use the at default keyword for your default case. You can try these new features in developer preview in Angular v17. We can't wait for you to use them and let us know what you think. So be sure to ng update once v17 is released. Until the next time, happy coding. The new control flow will definitely improve the template authoring experience. And honestly, we think you're really going to enjoy these updates. Now, here to tell us more are Pavel, Christian, and Alex from the Angular team. Hello, hello, everyone. How are y'all doing? Oh. Fantastic. Mark. Fantastic, Mark. What an amazing moment. So we launched the new brand today, and now we're launching this new syntax that I feel like is a great representation of what we're doing as a team and where Angular is going in terms of being modern. But how do we know as a team that it was time for this new syntax? Right, so I think there were many things that made us prioritize this project. Um, to start with, we have this uh, perspective of people using uh, ng4 and the GIF directives, and we see some issues on the GitHub and in conversation with developers, we could see some friction. Uh, the star syntax, for example, is not well understood and sometimes a bit quirky. So we knew that we could improve the template authoring experience with the built-in syntax. Standalone components were other motivating factor here. As of today, you have to import ng and g4 in almost every component, and this can get tedious. If we've got built-in control flow, we can remove the question of imports entirely. Finally, having the built-in control flow gives us more opportunities to optimize things when integrating signals and reactivity in the framework. As the example, the for loop can understand that it deals with signals and optimize change detection there. I think that overall, it was great experience for us. We had this opportunity of reviewing the entire uh, process of authoring tem templates and, and control flow and look at syntax, but also at the performance in type checking. Fantastic. All right. I'll be honest with you. When you think about this in com combination with standalone components, it makes a lot of sense because like you said, you have to import ng4, you have to import ngf, like all those things makes it harder to reason about for our learners. So I love this update for that reason, but check this out. I know and leading up to this, as people saw the RFCs, I got a lot of questions about this. Performance improvements. What is changing in terms of performance with this new syntax? Alex, can you tell us more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are a couple different performance improvements that we unlocked with the new syntax. Um, one of the kind of lesser obvious ones um, to think about is because for and if and switch are built into the framework, they don't have to go through the same public APIs that structural directives like ngif and ng4 do. They can kind of interact at a very low level with Angular's data structures. And so we got rid of some overhead there. Um, but then most of the performance improvements were centered around the for loop. Um, so we rewrote the logic that figures out the kind of what changes need to happen in the DOM to reflect the changes that you made in the list. And we made that algorithm much smaller and smarter. 
Um, for example, it understands when you swap two items in a list now, which was a case that showed up on the benchmarks that we followed um, where NG4 didn't do so well. Um, obviously, these are synthetic benchmarks, so the numbers and applications vary, but we've seen about in, in real material components, about a 30 percent uh, performance improvement in components that are pretty control flow heavy um, and it consumes less memory as well. And then finally, um, you saw me in the video earlier talk about the track being required. That's another kind of key performance optimization where we saw if developers forgot to put that in certain circumstances, they could like code themselves into a performance bottleneck. And so we make that mandatory, but also make it easier to specify to avoid those cases. Fantastic. Christian, I got a question for you. This is new syntax, right? But what if I'm just not ready to update yet, right? I, I just can't use it. I want to use V17, but I can't use the syntax. What can I do? Yep. So uh, the new syntax is completely optional. So you can kind of try it out in different places, see how you like it. You don't need to convert to it immediately. But if you do want to convert to it, we, we have an experimental migration that you can run. You just need to run ng-generate at angular slash core. Uh, column uh, control flow, and that's going to convert your entire app to the control flow. And that's also going to give you some examples where you can kind of see how the new syntax works and see what works best for you. But NGF oh, and NG4 aren't going anywhere right now. Oh, I love that. That sounds really great. Let's take some feedback from our community. All right, so can you still use pipes in the new control flow? Great question. Can you still use pipes in the new control flow? Absolutely, like every every syntax, expression syntax that was supported uh, in um, conditionals or like loops, they, they still absolutely work. Well, fantastic. I think what would be really helpful for the community, uh, we'll work to put together some examples to show folks how they can use that combination. That's would be really, really helpful. Uh, let's take another, another uh, piece of feedback from the community. All right. Does the new control flow syntax work with pipe? Okay, so what about sync pipe? Or I think they meant async pipe in this case. Yeah, I think people might be referring to the common pattern of using as like async pipe with if and as just to kind of alias or create a local variable. And we absolutely added this uh, feature so uh, people can move from the existing uh, common usage patterns to the new control flow. All right, uh, we're going to wrap this up. But I got one last question for you folks. What is something that developers should do today with this new feature? Give it a try straight away. Like giving the, all the improvements in the syntax and performance improvements, I think that the faster we get the feedback and kind of iron out all the uh, rough edges, uh, the, the sooner we will enjoy it. Fantastic. All right, friends, thank you to Alex, Pablo, and Christian. You folks have been fantastic. Thank you so much. And also thank you to the Angular community for all these questions and comments. Now, lazy loading in Angular has been a great way to optimize your applications by allowing you to delay the loading of certain parts of your app until when? Until they're needed. But what if I told you that we can go even further and do even better with the lazy loading experience? Well, I guess you'll just have to watch this next announcement to find out if we did. Jessica, take it away. Let me just move this placeholder out of the way. And now that I'm in your viewport, let's talk about native Angular deferred loading. Also, hi. I'm Jessica Janik, a senior software engineer on the Angular Framework team. Angular has supported native deferred loading of individual routes for some time now, and this is a great way to reduce your initial bundle size. However, if you have wanted to optimize your initial load and initial bundle size even further, your options have been limited. Defer loading individual components has not been an ergonomic experience and required advanced skills and a significant amount of code to make possible. We opened an RFC, a request for comment, with our vision for deferred loading, and you all loved it. Since then, we've been hard at work building this new feature, and we're proud to say that as of v17, the new defer block is available as a developer preview. That's right. You don't have to await anymore to see this promise resolved. Let's take a quick look at how you can make use of this in your applications. 
Defer works in your components template and allows you to separate out chunks of content that you'd like to be deferred loaded. Here's an example of a component where we have a few large components referenced in a section of your template that we'd like to load later so that they're not part of the initial bundle. Using Angular's new block syntax for templates, we'll add a new defer block around the area of the content we'd like to defer load. And don't worry, it's non-blocking. Each defer block requires a condition or trigger to specify exactly when defer loading happens. You can use these triggers with the new on clause. Let's load the large component when a specific element enters the viewport. Defer on viewport will trigger the fetching of your content once the provided element reference enters the viewport. Angular provides several built-in triggers for you to use in your applications. These include idle to load as soon as your browser reports it's in an idle state, interaction to load whenever something is clicked on, focused, or similar behavior, viewport to load when the content enters the client's viewport window, hover to load when the mouse is hovering over an area, timer to load after a specific timeout, and immediate to defer load right away after the defer block is rendered. You can use one of these triggers with an on clause. Here's an example. We're going to go with defer on viewport. What if one of the built-in triggers doesn't provide the functionality you need? Well, you can create a custom trigger. You can use the new when clause to provide whatever condition works for your application. In this example, once the when condition becomes true, the deferred loading is triggered. You can also mix and match to provide the exact conditions you're looking for. This affords you the perfect flexibility for your application. What if you'd like to prefetch your dependencies? Well, defer has your back. Just add prefetch on using one of the already mentioned triggers. Or similarly, you can provide a custom condition using prefetch when, and your defer dependencies will be prefetched. That's not all we have for you though. The new defer blocks also offer several additional areas for you to provide content that will show in various phases of your defer loading. For example, perhaps you want to show a placeholder before your deferred content loads. You can add that to the at placeholder section of the defer block. Maybe you'd like to show a loading spinner while the content is actively being fetched. You can do that too with the at loading section. I'm sure your spinner will be very fetching. For both of these, you can specify a minimum amount of time these templates are shown to prevent flickering in the case that the loading is super fast. The at loading template lets you also add a max length of time to wait before showing the loading template. That way, if your server responds super fast, the loading template wouldn't show at all. And if anything goes wrong, we have a place for that too. The add error template. Testing a defer block is a breeze too. We've provided a defer testing fixture that will let you manually cycle through a defer block's phases so you can verify at each step of the way that your defer block is configured exactly how you want. It's built right into the component fixture, so you'll feel right at home in the test environment. It certainly won't test your patience. Angular v17's new defer blocks offer you the ultimate in flexibility for defer loading whatever content you want. You can now optimize your initial load and bundle size to your heart's content. You can try out the developer preview of defer blocks right now with the v17 release. For more details and all the documentation, check out our brand new deferred loading guide. What's the best way to use these defer blocks? Well, to answer that, I defer to you. Live long and prosper, my friends. Okay, all right. Just a moment of transparency. I just love how we get to share like these fantastic updates, but still bring a little bit of humor like while we're doing so. It's really, really great. So let's keep that energy going and welcome Jessica and Andrew back to the show. Hello. All right, so let's see if 
Andrew's audio is still deferred. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Oh, hey, he's everyone. back. Fantastic. We got, we see the placeholder in the building with Jessica. That's fantastic. Uh, wonderful, wonderful video. Okay, let's jump right in. Andrew, since we didn't get to hear from you last time, what's the difference between deferrable views and lazy loading? Yeah, so it, it, it's more about semantics. Uh, so defer and lazy um, basically means the same thing, uh, but we prefer um, to use defer. Oh, fantastic. All right, let me follow up with you, Andrew. Uh, is the load of the component blocking when you're using deferrable views? No, it's, it's not blocking. Um, when using deferring template, Angular compiler generates dynamic imports under the hood, uh, which are invoked at runtime when your trigger condition um, is invoked. Yeah, just uh, remember that they're just blocks, non-blocking blocks, blocks <laughs> that are non-blocking. All right, <laughs> Jessica. Actually, uh, since you jumped in with that fun pun, I got something for you. Uh, does this technology open up the door for anything else? Because this is really robust as it is, but I know everyone's been asking us about the future. What does this open the door for, for us as a team? Well, we talked a little bit about progressive hydration back in the uh, server-side rendering section, and the defer blocks are really the like logical place for us to focus on for uh, enabling progressive hydration next. So that's like the top thing that we can probably think of doing with um, defer blocks moving forward. Okay, so let me follow up another question for you, Jessica. Uh, some folks have expressed the desire to create their own custom triggers. How can they do that? Well, they can certainly do that with the when clause that we have. They can just add a when clause and put whatever condition they want in there, and that essentially serves as a custom trigger. Fantastic. All right, I'll be honest with you. Uh, the chat is blowing up with questions for you, friends. So let's just jump to our community questions. All right, Jeremy says, I enjoy learning more about how this works under the hood. How does the defer block know when something is actually loading or errored or similar? Andrew, yeah. you want to take this one? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so as I mentioned, um, when defer block is used in the template, Angular compiler collects all the dependencies used within the block. And um, after that, Angular compiler produces a, a set of dynamic imports. And at runtime, those dynamic imports are invoked when the trigger um, condition is invoked as well. So this is kind of in a nutshell uh, what happens. Fantastic. I really love this technology. It's, I think it's magic. People have told me to rein back some of my excitement, but I think it's magic. Let's go to another, another question. Okay, Michael asks, how do you find out in your parent component when a certain component in a defer has loaded? Jessica, is this, is this a thing we can do at this point? Uh, I, what I'm unclear of with this question is like whether it's talking about within, because like the, the defer lives in the template. So you're in a component, you put the defer block in the template. So it's not like it's a parent component. I, so um, your so child components, this won't, they won't actually exist until they've been defer loaded. So the child wouldn't be able to report anything or do anything until it's actually been fetched and, and resolved. Are there any hooks or triggers or anything that we can know about in our template, or sorry, in our component that has a defer block to let us know that it's ready to be interacted with at least? Anything like that? Uh, at present, there isn't. Um, I believe there was some commentary on looking for that kind of notification in the RFC. So that's yeah. definitely an area where we could potentially future, um, add uh, new features in the future. Okay, great. Let's keep going with more questions. All right, how can we unit test defer blocks with Jest? Looks like an interesting challenge. Uh, Andrew, why don't you take this one? Yeah, sure. So um, as a part of the defer block, we provided uh, some additional APIs um, in a test bed. Um, and under the hood, it uses some runtime code that we have for, the, for defer blocks. So try using test bed. Um, if that doesn't work, then you know let us know. Or like if there are more integrations that are needed, let us know in, uh, on GitHub. And, uh, we'll look into that. Fantastic. Yeah, I remember uh, one of the things that we wanted to fit into Jessica's video was even more content about testing. So yeah, we're shipping this with testing features enabled. So we thought about you, Angular community. We care about you. All right. A huge thank you to Jessica and Andrew for coming on the show. Thank you both so much for sharing these updates. Now, just a reminder, 
we're going to be doing a very special fireside chat with angry leadership at the end of the show. So please keep those questions coming and keep putting them in the chat. Now, we've been giving you update after update, but can you believe that there is more? Well, believe it because there is. Here to tell you about more Angular V17 updates is the one and only Doug Parker. Doug, you're up. Howdy. My name's Doug Parker, and I'm a developer on the Angular tooling team. We've shown you a lot of incredible Angular features already, but we're not done yet. Here are a few more awesome features we'd like to highlight. Over the last few major versions, we've made standalone components a core part of the Angular experience. In version 17, we're making standalone the default means of building applications. This means ng-new and ng-generate will now create components, directives, and pipes as standalone by default. Our documentation has also been updated to use standalone in guides and examples. We believe this will make Angular much easier to learn for new developers, with ng-module being an advanced feature developers can learn about only when they actually need it. Now, don't worry, ng-module isn't going away. You can still use it just like you did before. And you can even opt out of the CLI change when you need to with the standalone false flag. Next, you might recall that we've been working hard to improve build times by migrating Angular CLI from Webpack to ESBuild and Vite. These act as modern bundling and dev serving tools with a special focus on performance. We're happy to announce that this is now enabled by default for new applications, yielding major build time improvements. As one example, the Angular Material documentation site was recently updated and received 2.5 times faster builds. That's just mind boggling. However, if you have a custom Webpack configuration, you won't see these benefits. Now, Webpack isn't going away in version 17, so you can continue to use it. However, we highly recommend moving to the new ESBuild-based build system for faster compiles, performance optimizations, and future improvements. For Angular DevTools, we've launched a new way to inspect and visualize your dependency injection graph. Have you ever wondered why some injection token wasn't found, or maybe why two components aren't sharing the same instance of a service? DevTools is here to help you understand your dependency graph so you can inject more confidently. Keep an eye out on the Angular YouTube channel for a video deep dive of how you can debug dependency injection like a pro with Angular DevTools. Angular inputs have received some updates as well. You can now add custom transforms, which update values as they are received as inputs. This allows components to accept a wider variety of inputs and then normalize them to a standard type. In this case, we're using the built-in Boolean attribute transform on an input called disabled to convert its value to a Boolean. This makes the input much easier to use. We no longer need to manually bind disabled to a Boolean literal. Instead, we can just set the attribute directly. It's so much cleaner. We also have a built-in number attribute for converting to numbers, and you can even create your own transforms. The only limit is your imagination. Next, we've added yet another great quality of life improvement for authoring CSS. In the past, Angular has always required component styles to be given as an array because a component can technically have multiple style sheets. However, in practice, we found that it's pretty rare for a single component to actually use multiple style sheets. I know I've never needed it. The array is unnecessary, adds visual noise, and can cause trouble for automated formatting tools. In version 17, Angular will now accept styles without an array, so you can just pass your string literal in directly. Both styles and a new property called style URL, singular, now accept a string directly. No more awkward array literals. If you do use multiple style sheets in a component, don't worry, arrays still work exactly like before. The only difference is that you don't need an array if you don't want it. Now, believe me, I could go on about even more awesome features in Angular version 17 and coming soon. However, that's all the time I have. You can find out more at blog.angular.io. The most important part to remember is to get all this goodness, all you have to do is run ng update. You'll get all these incredible features, performance optimizations, and bug fixes with minimal effort. Thanks for joining me on this whirlwind tour of Angular features in version 17. Don't forget to ng update, try them out for yourself. See you next time. 
Whoa. Okay, honestly, can you believe that that is actually not the entire list of updates that we're shipping with this release? So be sure to check out the release blog and the release notes on GitHub for more information. But friends, right now, we have Doug and Miles from the Angular team here to chat about this release and more. Welcome, Doug and Miles. Yeah, Thanks. Really, really happy to be here. Yeah. It's been a great show so far. So many updates. So much is happening. New brand, new mm -hmm. syntax. You just gave a video with nothing but updates. I mean, it's just so much. So with that in mind, it's just so many things that people could, could use right now when it releases. What is the feature that you think that they should do as your favorite? Like, call out a feature. I guess I, I think I'm going to cheat a little bit by picking one feature that's actually two features. OK. Uh, I'm going to pick Application Builder, which uh, I think you know, uh, Alan and some of the earlier videos talked about. Um, I, I think it's super cool because it's providing the uh, ES build and Vite improvements we've been talking about for massive build time improvements, uh, as well as also making it really easy to adopt server-side rendering and a lot of the improvements that we've seen there around hydration, all, the, all of those awesome features. So I think it's really cool that we sort of have this, this one builder that is sort of serving as a vehicle to provide both of these use cases. And I think that's really powerful. I agree. What about you, Miles? Any feature that you want to call out? Uh... I'm, I'm a big fan of the uh, new control flow. I got to say, that's one of the coolest things I think is going to be able to take out all the star NGF and star NG4s uh, in my components. I'll be honest with you. When I have been like researching it and looking at the RFC and doing all these parts, I just feel like looking at that syntax is just so clear what's happening. It's beautiful. It is really is beautiful. I agree with that. So one of the things that people like to do is make their applications beautiful. And one way they do that is with material. Now, you being on the material slash components team, can you share an update on what's the latest for that space? Yeah. Uh, so in version 17, we've got a couple big changes. Um, probably the biggest one is that we are now removing the legacy components that have been in there for a couple of releases now. Uh, I know that not everyone is 100% moved off of those yet. And so we are going to support using uh, version 17 of Angular, so you can still get like all this awesome new goodness while still using version 16 of Angular Material if you still need those legacy components. Uh, and then also in version 17, we've added a new uh, dimension to our theming. So, you know, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the color topography density that we support. Now we've added a base uh, as well. And base is kind of just for uh, common things uh, across the design system that aren't necessarily related to one of those other three. So like border radiuses would be a good example of uh, what goes in there. Well, so we're taking it to the next dimension. OK, I'll stop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so while uh, the video was playing, the, the comments and questions were flooded with so many questions. So I'd love to take some for the audience if you folks are up to answer some questions. All right, let's take some, some feedback from the audience. Uh, will the standalone flag still exist in the component decorator for standalone components? Yes, uh, the, the flag is still there. You do still need to set it. Um, however, this is kind of the thing that the Angular CLI is setting for you. So when you ng-generate, right. it's going to put that standalone true for you. Uh, so for all intents and purposes, you really don't need to worry about it. Um, it is still there. Maybe in the future, we might be able to clean that up and improve it a little bit more. Uh, but that's where we are right now for 17. OK, fantastic. Let's go with another question. All right, did the Webpack section get deprecated? Good question about Webpack and deprecated, because we did move to, right. yeah, to ES build. So uh, there's a little bit more here. Uh, meaning that will it be removed in V19, or will Webpack be around? more time to V19. So this is a forward-looking question, because we're on V17 right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what he's kind of saying is that uh, you know when we deprecate things, usually there's a couple major versions, right. and then eventually remove them. Um, so currently, Webpack, or Webpack Builder is still supported, still uh, fully active. Nothing's broken there. Um, it's also not quite yet deprecated. Um, so we've sort of promoted the new uh, ES build and beat stuff to stable. Uh, we're kind of making that the, the new default. If you ng new a new application, you're going to get ES build and beat out of the box. Um, and so that's kind of where we're going. We sort of have this new alternative uh, that's improving things. We want to push people towards that. Um, the old stuff is still still available, uh, still accessible, and it's not quite deprecated yet. Um, going forward, that uh, we do want to continue to push the community more towards uh, ES build and beat. Um, so you will continue to see more of that going forward. Um, and long term, Webpack will likely eventually be deprecated in Angular CLI, uh, but that is still going to be some versions away. So it's okay. not an immediate challenge for people to be worrying about. Fantastic. All right. Thanks for that feedback. All right. Let's take another one from the audience. Ah, oh, Material V3, the question of the hour. I, I Tell we us were, more. I knew we were going to get this one. <laughs> uh, so the changes that we made in, in version 17 here are kind of in support of being able to do um, Material 3 soon, hopefully 
uh, in a minor of uh, 17. So, yep, keep an eye out for it soon. We are working on it. <laughs> We're working on it. That's right. And that's how we work, right? We, we, we try to do our best to make things that will support our community and that will we can make those updates when they're ready so that way you have just a less hard time upgrading, right? We really care about our developer community, which I think is one of our hallmarks. Exactly. We don't want to push something out before it's ready. That's right. That's right. Man, fantastic. Thanks to both of you. And you know what? Before we get to our last segment, I just want to hear more questions, comments from the audience. I want to hear some of that feedback because I know that everyone's really excited. Uh, the new brand does it for me. It was needed. Bold move. I agree. I love the new brand. I remember when they first got previewed, it was just absolutely beautiful. So, fan, yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. DI debugging. All right. I'm going to be honest with you. Dependency injection debugging is one of those like small, but he, it's a small announcement, but a huge impact on the developer quality of life. Because one of the things you need to do is know where something's coming from in your dependency injection tree, right? You just want to know, is it coming from the component? Is it an environment injector? You want to know the difference. So being able to visualize that, it's going to change the game for your debugging experience. All right. Let's go Angular team. Let's go Angular community, right? Like we're working on all this really cool stuff and we're really doing it to do what? To serve you. Like you folks are the audience, the intended audience for all of our changes. So when we build something, we're really building it to serve you, the Angular community. So let's go you for being who you are. All right, friends. Now to close out the show today, we're going to do something very special. All right. So here in the studio, we have our engineering manager, Simone Coden, and then we also have our DevRo lead, Minko Getchev, here for a fireside chat. Minko and Simona, welcome to the show. So happy to be here, Mark. Simona, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing excellent. This has been such an incredible event. I'm so happy to be here. OK, wonderful. So I'm glad you're happy to be here because we have a bunch of questions for both of you. So let's, uh, let's keep the energy going. Uh, Simona, there was not a video update on Signals. Can you share what the latest is? That was a fantastic observation, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, definitely, I'm happy to share what the latest is. So Angular Signals is one of the largest changes that we have made to the fundamentals of Angular in some of the recent history. And in order to ensure backwards compatibility and also interoperability with ZoneJS-based change detection, we have been prototyping and designing a path forward so that we can bring everyone along and we can have everyone benefit from this new reactivity system. So in v17, we're stabilizing the public APIs for both signals and computed. And we've also shipped improvements to uh, change detections, as some of you have already noticed in the YouTube comments. Uh, when you're using signals inside on push components trees, only components that have changed will be marked for check and then change detected. And as a next step, we're also prioritizing uh, working on signal inputs and improving the zoneless experience and eventually working towards signal components as they are described in the request for comments that we published in on GitHub a while back. Fantastic. Let's stay on the same line of thought about signals. All right, so Mika, one of the things that I've noticed that people ask about, should they migrate from observables to signals? What's the story there? Yeah, good question. So both of them, they have their own use cases. Observables, they are great for processing a synchronous stream of events. So if you have, let's say, a stream of WebSocket messages, observables are great. And signals are perfect for managing your component state. They have, or will have, very close, very tight integration with the framework. And there will be a lot of benefits from using them with more local and fine-grained reactivity. OK, Miko, I want to stay with you for a second. Uh, there's something, a big announcement today. Uh, new brand, just new uh, website, everything. Are we building a new framework? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we are actually not building a new framework. What is happening is that Angular has been in this period that the community has been calling the Angular Renaissance or the Angular Momentum, where for the past about 18 months or so, we have been shipping a lot of improvements and bringing everyone along for the ride. At the same time, we have the Angular brand that has been very much the same since 2010 or so. We have this red Angular shield. What we wanted to do is to just bring the brand along and update it to fit this future-looking framework that Angular turned to be. Fantastic. All right, once again, the comments are on fire. Lots of questions for you and Simona. So we're going to take some questions from our community. 
All right, so are there any plans to bring together HTML, CSS, JS slash TypeScript files into a single file instead of keeping them separate? Mika, why don't you take this one? Sure, yeah. They're kind of together right now. If you build an Angular component, you can use inline styles, inline HTML, and everything is just going to work just fine. Yeah, I think so, uh, Christy, so you can do this now. So uh, if you're not doing that, if it's not working for you, open the issue so we can like know and we can uh, better support you. All right, let's, let's do another question. All right, uh, Simona, will the new docs support multi-language and translations? I suspect that Minko might actually be the right person to answer this question. Sure, Minko, tell us more. Yeah, let's talk about it. So currently we have Angular IO, and uh, there are a bunch of fantastic community members who are maintaining different localized versions of Angular IO. With Angular IO, we kind of made it really hard for them to do it, unfortunately. They have to maintain their own clone of Angular IO and just keep track of each individual change that we're making. For Angular Dev, we have way more exciting plans that are going to just make it way simpler for the community to maintain this localized story for the Angular documentation. So uh, there are plans for this. And uh, keep in mind that Angular Dev is in beta right now. We're going to be graduating it in the next six months or so. And this is coming along as well. OK, fantastic. Before we go to any more community questions, there's one that was asked before to me, like at some conferences that I was at recently, that Simona, I would love for you to answer for us. Because we have a lot of exciting avenues, right? So we saw what happens with the new block syntax, SSR, I mean, signals. There's so many things for us to explore. How is the team, like, how are we sure what to work on next? That is such a great question, um, Mark. And it is something that we actually ask asks ourselves and we work through. And um, we have thought a lot about what are our guiding principles, what are our values, and why we do the things that we do, and when should we work on, on those things. And I think it starts first with what our focus is. And currently, our focus is on compromising developer experience and blazing fast performance. So whenever we plan our roadmap and prioritize projects, we actually make sure that they fit into these buckets. And as guiding principles, we strive to make evidence-driven decisions, and we tackle problem spaces that are rooted into user feedback. Um, and we gather that input in many, many ways, both from existing Angular developers, but also from future Angular developers, like some of you here on the stream. And the ways in which we gather that input is either through our annual developer survey, through GitHub issues, uh, we run user research studies. We meet regularly with our Google developer experts and talk about our roadmap and um, feedback on features. We run customer roundtables. And we also work very closely with teams like Chrome Aurora and Chrome DevTools and collaborate on projects that are based on some of our shared research. Um, another dimension to this that is really important is that the framework is built on a solid foundation so when possible we actually tackle some of the technical debt that we've accrued um, and this enables us to continuously iterate and innovate um, and continue to do some of these research projects that we're working on as well oh fantastic i love that i love the feature of angular mingo did you have anything you want to add to that or and everything that Simona said was just great. Oh, Completes fantastic. and uh, fantastic. Let's take another community uh, question. How about module federation? I laugh, not because this is a bad question, because people ask us this quite a bit. Uh, model federa federation and Angular integration, should we expect any updates? Miko, I know something that you uh, spent some time on. Uh, tell us more. Yeah, it is uh, very unlikely to support module federation directly in the Angular CLI. Now, the problem there is that module federation has some kind of very unpredictable side effects that you can hit very easily because of this dynamic composition of your user interface. At the same time, we realize that many organizations, they have certain constraints that are not technical and they don't allow them to build their application as a whole, like holistic experience, and they need to work in isolation. That is why we want to enable module federation or micro front ends in general in the Angular CLI. So far, this has been possible through Manfred Stair's uh, module federation plugin. Right. And now we're working together with him on enabling this for ESBuild and Vite as well with native federation. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. All right. We're just about out of time, but I do have one more question for Simona. What will be the team's priorities moving forward? 
That's a really big question. And Mark, as you've seen, we've worked on a lot of a lot of things and we've shipped quite a bit as part of this release. So one of the biggest priority, I would say the biggest P0 that we have right now is get a bit of rest. So that was the first step. <laughs> Uh, but as we're looking towards uh, next projects, we're definitely looking towards completing and um, working towards signal-based components. We are continuing to improve the server-side rendering and pre-rendering experience. We're doing explorations like partial hydration and streaming, and even looking into resumability, where we've laid the strategy for unit testing, and we have shipped experimental support for Jest. We're also working on experimental support for Web Test Runner, and we're continuing to work towards stabilizing some of those features. As Miles has, has mentioned, we're very, very close to completing support for Material 3, and the team has done such incredible work on that, uh, and we're excited for that as well. And along all of these, maybe some of the major blocks that um, I've been talking through, we also have a bunch of quality of life improvements that we're constantly prioritizing so that we're reducing some of those, those friction points as folks are building Angular apps. Fantastic. Well, thank you to both of you for being on the show today. It has been fantastic to talk with you. And all right, everyone, that's really it for the show today. Thank you to the entire team. And honestly, thank you to you, the Angular community, for being uh, just a part of this. Because you know what? A framework is only as strong as its community. And we have a fantastic one filled with amazing contributors and developers like you. Angular V17 will be available on November 8th, so be sure to download it as soon as it goes live. Be sure to check out angular.dev right now. Do that, like seriously, right after the stream, go straight there. Uh, also check out the release blog and ng update later this week when the release is available. Friends, we will see you the next time and go build great apps. <laughs>